Well, hello. I'm Steve Latham. As, as you just heard from Jay, I'm the director of the uh, Yale Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics, which is a, a co-host of the conference. And I'm so glad you're all here, and I'm so glad you'll all be with us uh, tomorrow and Sunday as well. It is my um, it is my great privilege to offer what is my approximation of a formal introduction uh, to this evening's speaker. So, uh, please. A native of Australia, Peter Singer was educated at University of Melbourne and at Oxford. He's taught at Oxford, at La Trobe University, at Monash, and has held several other visiting appointments. Since 1999, he's been the Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics at the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. And from 2005 on, he has also held a part-time position of Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne, first in the Center of Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics, and then in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. You just heard a moment ago about uh, Peter's book, Animal Liberation, which early in his career brought him to international fame. But I want to point out that Peter is also the author, or co-author, of about 20 books, editor or co-editor of about a dozen more, has about 100 articles in peer-reviewed journals, has more than 150 contributions to other people's edited books, has about 400 op-eds and popular press pieces, scores of reviews, television appearances, I think a video, uh, reprints, uh, the, his reprint list would, would be a, a tenurable, uh, uh, and uh, 30 different languages. Uh, so. That's a long way of saying that by any standard, we are lucky enough to have with us tonight one of the world's leading public intellectuals. He's made field-defining contributions to, certainly to animal ethics and also to biomedical ethics, and important contributions in environmental ethics, the ethics of food, political ethics, and more broadly in ethical theory. Um, Peter was the founding president of the International Association of Bioethics, and with Helga Kusa, a uh, founding co-editor of the journal Bioethics. And outside of academic life, he's the co-founder and president of the Great Ape Project, uh, which is an international effort to obtain basic rights for chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. And he's the president of Animal Rights International. Uh, we could not be more privileged. So, Peter, welcome, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for that very warm introduction. Um, reminding me of all that writing made me feel tired already. Um, thank you, uh, Stephen, for not only for the kind things you said, but also for the fact that you did allow yourself to be influenced by the argument of that book, Animal Liberation. And I think that's really important. And obviously, I wrote it because I hope people would be influenced by it. Uh, but it doesn't always happen. Um, so I think all of those, you may not be the only one in the audience, all of those who, who are influenced by that argument, you should give yourself some credit that you were, had your mind open enough to listen to those arguments and think about them. And I want to also thank uh, Jay for having uh, put this uh, event together. I know it takes a lot of organizing to do conferences, uh, so that's not an easy task. <coughs> so. We are standing today, I believe, at the beginning of a long struggle for uh, greater rights for non-human animals, a struggle which has been going for some time, as Stephen suggested, but which still has a long way to go, and which we can hope that the lawsuit that Stephen has launched is a further significant step along that march. But I thought since we are at the beginning of what we believe will be that long road, but it's appropriate to remember somebody else who walked uh, a long road to freedom, <coughs> who died just yesterday, uh, and that's Nelson Mandela. Um, a couple of things that Nelson Mandela said are, I think, relevant for what we're talking about. Firstly, he said, what really counts in life is the difference you make for the lives of others. And I think that's something that we're also thinking about. We're, of course, thinking about the others as going 
including human beings, but going beyond the boundary of our species. Um, and there are many important and much neglected others whose lives we can and hope to make a difference to. The other thing that uh, Nelson Mandela said in, in an interview uh, when he was asked how he kept going in the face of the seemingly insuperable obstacles of uh, being imprisoned on Robben Island in uh, apartheid-dominated South Africa is he said, I approach every problem with optimism. Uh, and I think that's really important too. We can easily get dispirited. Um, people often say, how do you keep going when you see how animals are suffering uh, and continuing to suffer? Uh, but we also have to remember that uh, we have been making progress, that there is progress uh, that's being made, being made, and we have to be positive about the prospects of continuing to make that progress and in fact making much more progress over the next say roughly 40 years that I've been involved in the animal movement over the next 40 years um, to make much further progress still. Okay so that's by way of preliminary. Um, what I'm here to talk about is uh, who is a person and in particular what is a non-speciesist answer to that question, who is a person? So, uh, in order to do that, I first want to say something about what speciesism is and uh, why we ought to reject speciesism. That may well be familiar territory to uh, a lot of you. In fact, maybe pretty much everything that I'm going to say is going to be familiar territory to uh, a lot of you. But um, I, do need to, uh, I do need to say it for those who may not be so familiar, and uh, uh, to make the case that I'm, that I'm trying to put together. So, speciesism is an attitude of bias or prejudice um, against beings on the grounds of their species alone. And uh, this is something that obviously the, the term, which I did not have invented, uh, I got it from Richard Ryder, um, a British writer concerned with this issue, but I suppose I helped to popularize it and develop it the concept philosophically. Um, uh, obviously, it's intended to make the analogy with racism and sexism. <coughs> um, and in a similar way, it suggests that there's this prejudice or bias against beings who are not part of your own group, some group that is more powerful than others, and but can therefore act in ways that deny the interests of those outsiders. Uh, but because it's been so much part of human existence, it's sometimes hard for people to get to see what we're doing to other animals and the way we think about other animals as a bias at all. It just seems to be something natural or to many people justified. But I think it's worth looking briefly at some of the justifications that have been offered over the centuries because then we can also see that they fail and that we have to think again. For example, if we go back to the beginnings of Western uh, civilization, we find the roots uh, of, of our philosophy in ancient Greece, particularly in the work of Aristotle, who was more than any other Greek philosopher incorporated into later Western Christian thinking in the Middle Ages by figures like Thomas Aquinas. So Aristotle thought that the world is a teleology in which the less rational serve the more rational. And since um, humans are more rational than animals, animals exist to serve humans. And plants, for that matter, exist to serve animals. I don't think that uh, any of us really regard, in Aristotle's sense, the world as a teleology constructed in that way. But it certainly had influence um, because of its later incorporation into Christian teaching. And it fitted well into Christian teaching because the other root of that Western tradition coming out of the uh, Hebrew tradition 
and taken over by Christian teaching is the idea that human beings were created in the image of God after the creation of the other animals and that God granted us dominion over them which by many leading Christian thinkers was regarded as a kind of license to do what we want with animals. That's quite explicit in, for example, the writings of Augustine, um, who actually explains the puzzle why when Jesus <coughs> took the devils, um, did he put them into the Gadarene swine and let them drown themselves. Well, they drown themselves um, ran down the hill and drowned themselves in the sea. Um, why would he do such a thing? Well, Augustine explicitly says, to demonstrate to us that we have no duties to animals. And that's in keeping with his interpretation of man's dominion. And uh, uh, so that was an important viewpoint. Um, it's worth pointing out that it's something that Christians today are resisting and trying to reshape. In fact, only today in the New York Times you can find an article, I haven't actually seen it in the paper, so I don't know if it was in the, the physical paper this morning or will be tomorrow, um, a paper about uh, some new Christian thinking that talks about the work of Charlie Camosi, a Catholic uh, professor of Christian ethics at Fordham University and the author of a recent book called For Love of Animals and David Clough, an Anglican, uh, who's writing a two-volume work, uh, trying to reshape Christian attitudes to animals. So there's important work going on in trying to say, no, dominion does not mean we can do as we like with the animals. Um, it means that we are entrusted with God's creation to look after them well. And I certainly, you know, if, if you are a Christian, I certainly would encourage you to support and strengthen that reinterpretation because it's important. But historically we have to acknowledge that the much harsher dominion teaching has been influential and has been a force shaping those speciesist attitudes, particularly in the Western tradition. Which is not to say, unfortunately, that uh, other lines of thought, um, Eastern thinking, whether uh, Buddhist or Hindu, has really been free of speciesism. Um, Sadly, it hasn't, although the ideals that you read about there seem to be less speciesist. Um, if you uh, look at Buddhist teachings, for example, compassion for all sentient beings seems to be a primary principle. But um, which Buddhist countries are completely vegetarian? Um, there aren't any. Uh, so it's a way in which, I guess, our attitudes, our desires, our habits, um, corrupt uh, religious teachings even when the religious teachings seem to start off on a much better footing than uh, do the, those of, of the Western tradition. So that's another um, way of uh, defending speciesism which uh, I think we can reject in various grounds. Either we can simply reject the uh, authority of the, the scriptures and that account of uh, humans having been given dominion and reject that account of creation, or if we are within that tradition, we can uh, argue against that interpretation of it and reject speciesism in that way. Well, what else has been said in, in defense of it? Uh, obviously, there's been a more recent philosophical discussion, but in fact, relatively few philosophers really come out directly and say, uh, I think we are justified in giving preference to beings who are members of our species just because they are members of our species. Um, mostly they try and say there are important differences about human beings such as their cognitive abilities, their rationality, their use of language uh, and so on that justify us in giving more weight to these beings. This is not strictly speaking speciesism, though it may seem like a disguised form of speciesism. But it is a claim not based on species, but based on certain characteristics which happen to coincide roughly with the species boundary. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. 
it's important in understanding the concept of person. But there are a small number of philosophers who've defended speciesism outright, of whom probably the best known as a philosopher is uh, the late Bernard Williams, quite a, a distinguished British philosopher. And uh, he came out um, only reasonably shortly before he died with an uh, essay called The Human Prejudice, um, in which he actually defended that as a kind of prejudice. Uh, and I found it rather surprising in a philosopher of his uh, general distinction, because in the end, he, he really comes down to this. He asks us to imagine that the planet is being taken over by a race of aliens who are, um, let's say, more intelligent, more powerful, and perhaps morally superior to us. And um, maybe they think that the planet would be a better place without us because of the various, let's say, uh, proneness to violence or whatever it is you can imagine that. Um, so if that were to be the case, William says, um, it wouldn't really, we shouldn't really ask from the point of view of the universe whether the things would be better for all considered with or without humans. The only question that we should ask is whose side are you on? Well, that seems to me a strange argument for a philosopher to put because very obviously it can be used in other, concept, in other contexts where we would outright reject it. If somebody says to us, for example, let's assume those of us who are of European descent in this room, primarily if someone says, you know, well, um, if it comes to uh, asserting the rights of white people, we can imagine this being said in, in apartheid South Africa, for example, uh, over uh, the Africans, um, the only question to ask really is, whose side are you on? And of course, you're a person of European descent like me, let's say, so of course you'd be on our side, wouldn't you? Um, we can immediately see that as a terrible argument, um, an argument that we ought to reject. And uh, in the same way, I think, it's a terrible argument to simply say that because we are humans, we ought to give preference to human beings and to human interests, as if that's something that automatically follows from the fact that that's the group that we're in. Um, and, of course, the practical ramifications of William's argument are not about how we're going to respond to aliens, because these aliens haven't arrived, and who knows whether they ever will, but um, we are living on a planet with billions of non-human animals whom we are regularly uh, oppressing, um, inflicting all sorts of, of horrible life conditions on them um, and then killing them, and that's the practical ramification. And uh, the defense of that in terms of saying, well, it's reasonable for humans to have a prejudice in favor of the interests of humans, seems to me to be a mistake, and one that we should certainly be rejecting. So that's really um, the idea of speciesism and a very short account of the reasons why I think we should not think that just being a member of the species Homo sapien is enough to give that being more consideration than you would give to another being of a different species. And in fact, what I think follows from the rejection of speciesism is this idea of giving equal consideration to the similar interests of all beings that have interests. And let me just say uh, a word about, about what I mean by that. So firstly, all beings that have interests, for me, means beings that are conscious beings, that if you like have some sort of subjective awareness, that are capable of feeling pleasure or pain at a minimum, and perhaps a lot more, of course, than just pleasure or pain. Um, one way of, of getting at this idea is to say, is there something that it's like to be that being? So each one of you can say, well, there is something that it's like to be me, and I know of other people that there's something that it's like, it's like to be them. I can empathize with what it's like to be them. Some people will very like me and I can very quickly empathize with what it's like to be them. Other people are different, not so quickly, but I can still empathize. Um, and with non-human animals too. 
we can do the same. That is, we can empathize with what it's like to be them in varying ways and again to varying degrees. Probably, for example, most readily we empathize with mammals, we empathize with their care for their young, their grief if their young dies, um, a lot of other aspects about their social relationships depending on what species we're talking about. It's harder for us to empathize with um, fish and try and work out what's going on, except perhaps in some pretty extreme cases, as for example where they've been hauled up out of the ocean and they're suffocating in the air, maybe then we can start to say, well, yeah, there's definitely something that it's like to be that fish, and it's pretty awful for the fish. Um, and, you know, then we may get to cases where we're really even more um, uncertain than that, uh, about insects, for example, or um, some other in invertebrates. And I think that when we get to plants, um, we can be pretty confident that there's nothing that it is like to be a plant from that subjective perspective. So when we have this idea that there are beings with interests, beings with interests because they can experience things, then I think we ought to say, and we ought to give equal consideration to similar interests. So the interests may not be similar in, in every respect, they're obviously not. You presumably have an interest in hearing about the possibility of non-human personhood, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Um, Non-human animals don't have such an interest. They don't have the capacity to understand that concept as far as, as, far as we can tell anyway. So um, they don't have that interest. But we do share some interests, and the case of the fish that I mentioned is we, we have an interest, for example, in not feeling pain. And I presume that, that the fish can feel pain as uh, at least other vertebrates and probably some invertebrates can as well. So, where we have similar interests, similar amounts of pain, for example, we ought to give them equal weight. That's the ethical consequence of rejecting speciesism. All right, so having said that, let's look now at this question of personhood and then bring the two together. The, the, the concept of a person, it seems, enters the Western tradition through, it's a, originally a Latin word, persona, um, through the Latin word for a mask, which in uh, Roman theatre was used by the actors in plays. They would put on, if you like, a mask and become that character, or as we might say, they would take on that persona by wearing the mask and the audience could know which person, which character they were. But that would not have been a very significant um, use of it, except that it was adopted in the early Christian theological discussions of the Trinity. The Trinity, of course, is a somewhat mysterious Christian doctrine, even Christians will, will recognize that, in which um, Christianity is a form of monotheism, although there is a concept of God and there is a concept, there is uh, Jesus, um, who was supposed to have been a human being on earth, and there is also the Holy Spirit. So the doctrine of the Trinity is that there are these three in one. And the term that was used to describe this um, by Tertullian, a, a very early Christian theologian, um, we lived from around 160 to 225 AD, was that the Trinity is three persons in one. And because he used the term person to explain what it was, these three things, and how they, they could be one, that they had this one element in some sense, um, the term person became very important. Uh, taken up by Augustine again in his discussion of the Trinity, and uh, defined then by the early Christian philosopher Boethius, uh, who lived in the 6th century AD, um, who actually ventured a definition of person in the context of discussion of the Trinity, and he said it was um, a rational thinking substance. So essentially I guess what Boethius was saying is that um, 
the uh, and God and uh, Jesus and uh, the Holy Spirit have in common this idea that they are rational substances of, of some sort. Um, uh, that's what they have in common. So that's how the idea of rationality in some form got into this concept of person. And it percolated down through the centuries so that um, more than a thousand years after Boethius, the English philosopher John Locke, who of course was very influential in uh, early American political thought in uh, the Constitution of Virginia and on the thought of Thomas Jefferson and so on, um, John Locke defined a person as um, a rational thinking substance that is aware of itself as the same being um, o over time. So some kind of, uh, again, rationality, but some sense of self-awareness, self-consciousness, awareness of your own existence over time, was Locke's idea. Um, and he was interested in this concept particularly because he was interested in questions about personal identity, which philosophers have continued to discuss and, and still discuss today. Philosophers discuss questions like, um, what is it to continue as the same person? What is it to be the same person? So suppose, for example, that um, you and your friend were um, in a car accident, and in that car accident, um, your body was mangled completely beyond recognition, but your brain survived intact, whereas uh, your friend's brain was mangled completely, but your friend's body uh, survived intact. And quickly the surgeons were able, realizing the situation, to transplant your brain into your friend's body. So who survived the crash? Um, you or your friend? Well, um, if Locke is right, and if we assume that thought and self-awareness goes with the brain, which seems like a reasonable hypothesis here, if we can really keep the brain going, then when you recover from this uh, operation, uh, you still remember who you are. That is, you, the brain, still remembers uh, uh, the being, the, the, the person that it was, um, but when you get in the look in the mirror, you get a shock, of course, because the body is, is not the body that you're familiar with, and that takes a bit of adjusting, but you have survived. So that's another way of getting at the idea of what is a person. It's the, it's the you that has survived in this sense. So um, this is, uh, philosophically, I think, the, the sort of the central idea of a person is this idea of um, some being that is self-aware to a certain extent. And you could say the idea of rationality is subsumed in the idea of self-awareness. If you're um, capable of being aware of yourself as existing over time, you've got at least a degree of rationality, um, enough to be regarded as a person. So that's one important uh, concept. There's another idea that has been floated uh, in the philosophical literature that's worth mentioning because it does connect up with something else important about the idea of a person. And that's the idea that a person is a being with a certain kind of moral status. So on this view, person is not descriptive. It's not saying you have certain characteristics like rationality or uh, self-awareness or something like that. It's rather a moral term. It's a term that recognizes this moral status. The clearest example that I know of somebody um, explicitly defining a person in this way is the philosopher Michael Tooley, contemporary American philosopher, who back in the 70s wrote an important article uh, on abortion and infanticide. And in that article, he just stipulates that by the term person, he means a being with a serious right to life. So no descriptive content at all. Then, of course, the whole question is, well, which beings have a serious right to life? And Tooley then produces an argument which does, in fact, relate somewhat to that Lockean view of what a person is, because he thinks that to have a serious, Tooley this is, thinks that to have a serious right to life, you have to be capable of having future-oriented desires. So to have future-oriented desires, that is, for example, to 
want to be able to do something in the future, which if your right to life is not respected, you won't be able to do, is to um, be self-aware, to, to understand that you exist over time. If you simply exist in some kind of moment-for-moment -moment sense, clearly you can't have desires about the future because you don't even understand that you're the same being that existed a few moments ago and the same being that will exist, all being well, a few moments or maybe longer further down the line. So there is in fact a connection, although Thule doesn't say that he's drawing on Locke's uh, account of person. There is a connection between what he's doing and that view. And I don't think that that's um, an accident because I do think that um, there is some moral significance in this idea of self-awareness. And I'll, I'll come to that uh, uh, in a moment. But the other thing I want to say before I leave the idea of the, um, if you like, the purely ethical definition of what a person is, the, the one that's purely based on moral status or rights or values, is that, um, again, this is something that is used in this society, most notably in the recognition of legal personhood for corporations, which is a tremendously important idea in the practice of law uh, today. And I know that some of you know a lot more about this uh, practicing law than I do. Um, but uh, a very large part, part of what lawyers standardly do in uh, corporate law relies on the idea that corporations are legal persons who can sue and be sued and, and so on. Now, it's not as if we sort of suddenly recognize that corporations have certain characteristics like being rational and self-aware and therefore we're going to say they're persons at law. It's rather a decision that we made, a social decision, a political decision, uh, a legal decision to bestow personhood on corporations. We didn't have to do that. We could have had perfectly sensible arrangements in which we didn't have such things as corporations uh, with legal personhood, but we decided that there were advantages for the conduct of business and so on in, in doing that. So in this sense, there's an element of it's up to us to decide who persons are and to think where that idea of bestowing this moral status on beings is going to do uh, some good. It's going to do more good than it will do harm. All right, so now I've said a little bit about speciesism, and I've said a little bit about what it is to be a person. The obvious task is to bring together the idea of what it is to be a person with the rejection of speciesism, which I briefly outlined and defended. And to do that, I should mention yet another sense of the term person, a very common sense, which I haven't mentioned as yet, and that is the idea that person simply means human being. And you can, you know, probably, if you just talk to people who are not philosophers or not lawyers thinking about non-human personhood or not uh, animal rights activists thinking about that, um, that's the most common answer you get if you, you ask somebody, so what is a person anyway? They'll probably say, well, it just means a human being, just a, a synonym or an equivalent of a human being. And there are lots of uses that support that. Um, you know, if you, um, you might uh, step into a, a room, a lecture theatre like this, I don't know, possibly, it says, um, permitted to hold 250 persons. Well, um, it clearly means human beings. It doesn't mean that, for example, if we allocated personhood to whales, that then we could have 250 whales in this room. Um, so uh, that's a, 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 a very common usage. But note that it's a change, a significant change, from the usage of uh, Tertullian and Augustine and Boethius and Locke, who did not limit this to the members of the species Homo sapiens, human beings, that is. And in fact, in its early use, they quite explicitly were not limiting person to members of the species Homo sapiens. Because in the Trinity, only one of those three was a member of the species Homo sapiens, or a human. The other two clearly were not. And if you want to get further into more arcane 
Christian theology, then there are lots of other persons too. There are angels. Angels are persons, if you think that they exist. And um, uh, you know, so they're obviously not human. So the original concept of a person, including its use in Christian theology, is not speciesist. And that's to its credit, I guess. Also makes it a more useful concept for those of us wishing to argue that you can be a person even though you're not a human being. The term human being itself is, is somewhat loose and is often used in various ways um, to suggest sometimes, for example, that somebody has the characteristics that humans have, you know, truly human being, or we might say of someone who is obviously a member of the species uh, Homo sapiens, um, that uh, what they did was completely inhuman. Um, so we use that term somewhat loosely, but if you wanted to make it precise and to fit with the idea of discussing speciesism, um, you could say it means member of the species Homo sapien. And then we can look at whether the concept of person should be regarded as being in some way equivalent to member of the species Homo sapien, um, or as not extending, as, as including all and only members of that species. And I think it's uh, probably already reasonably clear from what I've said why I don't think we should be doing that. Uh, why, if we were to do that, we would be giving this concept, which, as I say, sometimes is descriptive, but where it is often descriptive of particular characteristics which we might regard as morally significant, like rationality and self-awareness, or sometimes perhaps is purely a matter of moral status. Um, and we would be limiting that on species lines. We would be limiting it to members of a certain species, which, as I argued, I don't think we should be doing. So, what can we do with this? What kind of changes can we make? Well, I think we should insist on the term being used in this philosophical sense in which it has a very ancient history and good philosophical antecedents and makes pretty good sense as a term, but insist that it be used in a non-species way. So we should say, okay, well, let's use the term person to mean something like a being with self-awareness or a being with its sense of its own existence over time. Um, or if you want to include some elements of rationality which could be part of that. Let's, let's do that. Um, but let's acknowledge that um, there are then going to be some members of our own species that in those characteristics that make up the idea of a person, some members of our own species that have less of them, have them to a less, lesser degree, less developed, than some members of other species, than non-human beings. Now, if we talk about something like self-awareness or rationality or sense of your existence over time, these are somewhat vague um, terms. And, of course, we could have high levels or low levels of this kind of thing. We could um, insist on high levels of rationality that would involve being able to follow abstract philosophical discussions of the kind that you're getting now, um, or we could have something very much less than that. We could have self-awareness, an awareness of your own existence of t over time that requires the ability to plan ahead for long periods, to perhaps to have some sort of life plan even, if you like, at one extreme what you're going to do throughout the rest of your life, or maybe just to plan for the next year or the next summer or something like that, or we could have something much more short-term than that. Whatever we do, whatever level we pitch this at, we're going to come across this problem that I just mentioned. The problem that the boundaries of this idea are not going to run parallel to the boundaries of our own species.
So if we put the level high, if we put the level at uh, having the ability to understand abstract reasoning, then clearly we're going to leave out quite a lot of members of our own species. We're going to leave, leave out, for instance, all small children, um, and uh, we're going to leave out people whose um, intellectual abilities are somewhere in the subnormal range, exactly where exactly you, that you're going to have that cut off is not so clear, but there's going to be quite a few left out. If we, on the other hand, try to lower the level so that we include as many human beings as possible, we stand the risk of emptying these ideas of self-awareness or rationality altogether because if we really wanted to include all human beings, of course there are some human beings who from birth have such severe brain damage or perhaps even in the case of anencephalics, the absence of the entire cortex, uh, that they are not in any sense rational or self-aware beings. Uh, in fact, in the case of anencephalics, they're not even sentient or conscious beings, it seems. Um, but if we, and if we go a little bit above that, we'll certainly get sentient or conscious beings, but um, we won't really have beings who have much awareness. On the other hand, what we will do is we'll include a vast range of non-human animals. Because, um, again, all of the birds and mammals, perhaps all of the vertebrates, are going to have a better claim to show self-awareness than some very pr profoundly disabled human beings. I think it makes sense in this situation to um, have a level of self-awareness that, on the evidence available to us, includes most human beings beyond infancy, um, but also includes significant numbers of non-human animals, but by no means all mammals, uh, or birds or mammals, let alone vertebrates. So what I'm thinking of here won't surprise you if you're familiar with the context of uh, non-human personhood uh, discussions or with uh, the Great Ape Project, for example. Um, what I'm thinking of here uh, is standards that recognize that some non-human animals do show self-awareness and do show, uh, to varying degrees, capacities for rationality. And, um, you know, we, there's a lot of research that you could discuss here about uh, evidence of self-awareness in non-human animals. Um, one rather crude but uh, commonly cited standard is the mirror recognition test. Uh, do, does the animal recognize that what it's looking at in the mirror is itself? Um, does it perhaps even use that reflection in order to discover various things about itself? There are certainly some non-human animals that do that. Um, again, most, most obviously chimpanzees, but all of the great apes to some extent, uh, at least some individuals, can pass that mirror test. Uh, among cetaceans, dolphins have been shown to pass that test. It's quite possible that other cetaceans can too, but clearly they're more difficult to, um, to perform that test on. Um, elephants uh, can pass the, the mirror recognition test. So um, that would be one way. I'm not saying that, that that's the best standard. Um, I think we need things that are more nuanced to different species than that. Uh, dogs don't pass the mirror test. Is that because um, it's, they rely much more on a sense of smell than a sense of sight, that's a possibility. So there's a lot, a lot more that could be said about that and there may be people in the audience who are better qualified uh, to report on that than I am. So I'm, I'm not really going to go into that um, in detail, but if you want to comment um, in discussion, uh, then, then that would be good. Um, so if we do that, um, then essentially what we are saying is that uh, there are these non-humans that have these characteristics and I think we can then argue that these are important characteristics that contribute to 
or arguably contribute to a special moral status for these beings. Uh, that's a controversial claim in, in two different directions. It's controversial for people who want to say the only beings with this special moral status are human beings and therefore want to deny that you can extend this special moral status that human beings allegedly have to non-human animals. But you can also get flagged from the other side. Um, I think we're going to get it at this conference from Karen Davis, for example. I'm not sure whether Karen's in that tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow, but uh, I was just wondering if I'm just using the... Not yet here. Not, not yet here, okay. Um, who will be arguing um, that this introduces a gulf between different animals? Um, and so let me say it uh, very clearly that um, the principle that I mentioned before in rejecting speciesism, the principle of equal consideration of interests, does not apply only to persons. It applies to all beings with interests, which means it applies to all beings capable of feeling pain or enjoying their lives, capable of, capable of being miserable or being happy, whichever way you want to put it. And you don't have to be a person for that to be true of you. And as I now suggest that we define person. That is, you don't have to be a self-aware being. You simply have to be a conscious being, a being who can feel pain, and I think that's quite enough. Um, now, that still also leaves it open, where the, uh, which beings are self-aware to the degree required to be a person. And uh, that may extend to a much wider range of birds and mammals than I've been suggesting. Um, that's possible. But I think that there is not only a defensible philosophical position that says that being self-aware uh, and rational in this way gives you grounds for some special moral status, but I think that there is also some potential value for the animal movement in taking that line, although I can see that there is also some potential risk. Let me first say why I think that it's a, a philosophically defensible view. The idea here is that while certainly you can, any being that's conscious at all can be harmed by um, having pain inflicted on it or depriving it of pleasures or enjoyment that it would otherwise have, um, there is something else that you can do to beings with this kind of uh, more time-related viewpoint. And that is, um, you can thwart their future-directed desires. Um, you can interfere with their choices. And I think to make a choice in the full sense of the term, perhaps some sort of self-awareness, some recognition of, well, I could do this or I could do that might be relevant. So if you think that autonomy is an important value, you might say you can violate the autonomy of self-aware beings in a way that you can't with beings that are merely conscious but not self-aware. And, um, as I've tried to argue in some of my work, practical ethics and rethinking life and death, um, and this agrees with the, the point that Michael Tooley was making in that article, uh, perhaps you can, by when you kill them, you may do something that is a more serious wrong because it thwarts all of their future related desires and perhaps cuts off a life that is integrated over time in a way that um, the life of a being that does not see itself as the same thing subsisting over time at different time periods, uh, that kind of life is not integrated. So what I'm suggesting is that there, there's an arguable case for saying there are some harms that you can do to beings who are persons that uh, you just can't do to beings that are not persons because they're not capable of being harmed in quite that way. So I'm not, you know, I'm not completely sure that this argument's right. It's something that I've put forward and defended in various ways. I've had pushback from some good philosophers and from some people in the animal movement that I respect. So it's something that I still am a bit uncertain about and um, been rethinking recently. But that seems to me to be a, at least a, a possibly defensible argument. And um, so then if it is, is there some point in advancing it beyond the fact that you think that Philosophically, it's true. Well, the point, and this is the this was what led Paolo Cavalieri and myself to 
launched the Great Ape Project back in, it's pretty much uh, exactly 20 years, I think, back in 1993 we launched it. Um, it's possible that by getting a better recognition of the special moral status of some non-humans, chimpanzees would be the most obvious example to start with, and getting them a different legal status, it's possible that they can serve as a bridge over what is now the very wide and deep gulf that we have in our conceptions between humans and non-human animals. So we think of us as being very special and different and that makes it easier for us to think of them, all of the animals, this vast group of very different beings, of all of them as somehow separate from and of course vastly inferior to us. And it's possible that if we can raise the status of some of these animals, we'll get people to see that we're not so different from them. We're not, it's not such a huge difference of kind. It's a difference of degree between us and them. And that's why, of course, the chimpanzees um, and more generally the great apes are uh, the kinds of beings that we might start with to see the relationships between them and us, the similarities between them and us, and perhaps to change their status, not in a way that simply leaves the other human beings for whom we cannot mount such a strong case for their rationality and their self-awareness, not in a way that just leaves them to be forever consigned to the outer darkness of non-persons, but on the contrary, in a way that suggests that there's not really a gulf at all, there's a series of small steps that leads from us through chimpanzees and bonobos, through gorillas and orangutans, through gibbons and siamangs, and through the uh, other primates, and, uh, and so on, um, to uh, uh, other beings that develop more within, but genetically further from us, like elephants and cetaceans and so on, um, and then to all of the animals that we recognize as having some degree of consciousness. So um, that's essentially how I would uh, answer the question, uh, who is a person in a non-speciesist way? And that's why I think that this is a worthwhile question to ask and a worthwhile question to answer in a way that um, emphasizes the similarities between us and some non-human animals and tries to use that as a bridge to uh, changing attitudes to non-human animals as a whole. Thank you very much.